So first, I want to say thank you to everybody. I'm so excited to share what I know, and hopefully I can help you sell and buy in the coming future, okay? And uh, for sure, you know that we, we are we are a very great team. Me and uh, Be Becky, Becky is our, our mortgage broker, and the other three agents, uh, Selena, Daniel, and uh, Jamila, uh, they're all in my team. So we try to help everybody every day, all right? We work very hard and hopefully, have you accomplish what you're looking for, okay? Now, uh, first, because it's Wednesday, I just want to give you some idea what's going on right now. In the Toronto Bay State Bar, we cover the whole, uh, we call it GTA. It's exactly like the map, right? It's a seven area. But 95% of the sale, it happened from, from City of Toronto, York, here, Houghton, and, and Durham area. The rest is, is happened in Simcoe and uh, Dublin region, okay? And yes. what happened in February, we have 4,783 sold, which is very great because in December and January, it only about just over 3,000. It's kind of very disappointed. Now, suddenly the sale go up 54%. And the average price is on, is close to $1.1 million. Although the price is didn't go up as fast as the sale, but still very good number. All right, mm -hmm. and I want to explain to you why suddenly we have so many sales. If you look at the uh, second uh, graph, we can see uh, this is a comparison, 13 months com comparison. Yeah. So last Feb last year, February, is we had $1.33 million average price. Now we have $1.01, uh, nine already. And you can mm -hmm. see the the orange line is is before the sales suddenly go up rather than go down. And then, then the average price also got a little bit, try to recover, right? Now, as I mentioned, why we have so much sell, mainly because we have new listing go up, all right? Since since January already go up from December and then gradually they still go up in February and then the sale go up because we, we do have a lot of buy in the market right now. Everybody waiting for a house for sale. Unfortunately, the seller a little bit uh, hesitate to put the house in the market. Once they sell, they become the buyer already, and then they have they worry about the mortgage or, or other issues. Now, this interesting is, illustration on the left hand side, you can see it's a buy market and seller market. So, buy market basically is there's a lot of home for sale and only have a few uh, uh, number of buyers looking for home. That's what we call buyer market. And on the other hand, the seller market is we have a bunch of buyers. Except what happened right now? We are accumulating a lot of buyers, but we don't have enough house for sale. So how do we define where we are? Uh, are we in the seller market right now? So how we define it? Basically, we look into how many months of inventory of home available for sale every month. Okay, so in fact, in February. We have uh, 4,700 homes sold. And at the end of February, we only have left 9,600 something uh, for sale. So it means that the amount of inventory is two months. Once this two months inventory sale is nothing for sale in the market at this point. And that's why we think this is called a seller market. At the same time, the absorption rate is a 50%. It means that every 100 homes on, on, for sale, 50% will, will go very, very fast. So we are in the seller market right now, actually. Uh, even even the people say, saying that, oh, it's, it's difficult to buy, and that's why there's a lot for sale. Not necessarily, okay? And you can also compare the sale price, which last February, we had $1.334 billion average price. Now it's one point zero nine five million the price actually come down 28%, which is a lot. And a lot of uh, buyers who have money, this is the, a good time for them to buy. And if you can afford it, buy right now, because once the interest rate stabilize or even going down, the market will be very, very crazy more than last year, actually, okay? This slide show you what's the majority type of home actually selling in GPA. 43% actually in detached and 30% in condo apartment. In fact, when I start my career, the percentage of condo for sale 
is probably around 20 to 21 percent. But in the last 10 years, more condo in the market right now. Okay. Uh, and of course, there's 10 percent in the Frio townhouse and then another 8 percent on condo townhouse. Okay. And of course, this um, um, ratio will be very different from uh, in different cities. Okay. But this is called a GTA. Now, if you want to buy the detached home, you can see from last year, February, is the detached home is $1.8 million. But all the way to February this year is only 1.4. It, it dropped 20%, it dropped which is uh, still a lot. And you can see both price and the sale go up at the same time. It's very good side, the trend would go up that way because both, both a number is go at the same time. So, so if you have money again, don't wait because when you're waiting, these two number will not come down. We we'll go, we we'll continuously go up. Okay. And if you want to buy condo, the condo, the, um, the, the, it didn't go down 20%, it only come down about 12% from last year, February. Now, the average price of condo apartment is 700. Uh, and uh, seven hundred and five thousand dollars, which is a very good number. It's not very expensive now, they honestly, right? You go out to rent an apartment, one bedroom already close to twenty five hundred every month already. So you, if you have money, buy the condo is is a good choice too. This chart uh, tell you how many home actually sold in February. Have uh, this is five area is contribute ninety five percent of sales in, in the whole GTA. So in February, the whole GTA is 4,007 homes sold. And um, of course, almost half of them is happening in the city of Toronto. But the rest will, will be in York region, Pierre region, Houghton, and uh, Durham. And, and of course, Durham is, is a very hot area in the last five years because of the price is very uh, competitive. Now, this is, uh, this is the price, okay? so. You can see the, the average price of GTA and average price of city of Toronto, they are very, very close. It's close to $1.1 million for average price. And the next one would be uh, uh, the, the York region, which including the Markham, the Market, Warren, and Stowe area. Uh, the average price is 1.3. In York region, including the Markham, mm -hmm. uh, Warren, Stowfield, Richmond Hill, the Market, Aurora. And then in Pier region will be Mississauga, mm. uh, Brenton, Houghton will be Oakville, yeah. uh, uh, Burlington, and Milton. And then the Durham will be Pickering, Ajax, uh, Whitby, Oshawa, Carrington. Mm. Now, everybody will want to buy detached home. And of course, nowadays it's very expensive compared to a couple of years ago. And of course, that's why everybody go to the Durham region. You go to Durham region, the average is actually start from less than $1 million. So everybody going there, especially the people start going to uh, uh, Oshawa and Carrington. Uh, they don't mind to be far away from the central of Toronto because of the price, okay? And the next one, hot one, of course, you go back to the mm. uh, city of Toronto, uh, as well as the uh, uh, York region, okay? Those people who, who think that detached home uh, it, or we call a freehold is very expensive. Of course, they consider buying the condo apartment. And that's what the sale in condo is not bad too. But of course you have to pay attention to this chart. The most expensive condo is not in city of Toronto, is in Houghton, which is the old way. Okay. And they have a lot of deconstruction there too. In the next meeting, if I have, uh, if I can uh, have a second uh, summer with you guys, I would uh, talk about city of Toronto because city of Toronto they have an east, central, and west. It's a big area. Uh, half of the sale is in city of Toronto. So if you guys want to buy condo apartment in a good price and good location, probably you should start in Scarborough. Okay. And uh, now if you look, look look back at this chart. Uh, if you want to start looking for a condo, if you don't mind distance, go to uh, Durham uh, area. Okay, you start from 537,000 only. Okay, and the next one, of course, is the uh, uh, Pierre region, which is the Mississauga and then 
and the brand. And this does uh, I, I, this does very special because I try to put the town home uh, freehold or condo town together because it's a choice for the consumer. Uh, because if you if you buy a freehold, of course you don't pay the condo fee, but the price price right is not uh it's not uh, very low. Uh, the lower price in Doham is uh, 871000 But you buy the condo townhome, you pay almost $200,000 less, which is very good for the first time buyer, right? You don't have to buy a house immediately, uh, especially for the first time buyer or you just start to work. You try to save some money, then buy a condo townhome first, then make your money Thanks. and go to, go to field townhome, okay? And, uh, and of course, the next choice to buy a home maybe and go back to Toronto, uh, which is 827000 for the condo townhome. Uh, if you go to uh, Scarborough, maybe you can pay a little bit less than $800,000 for, uh, for the condo townhome, okay? Now, uh, I'm a mortgage agent with Pineapple Financial, which is uh, right now we have about six or 700 agents right now, and uh, we rebranded. So if you haven't heard about it, it's just because we rebranded it about a year and a half ago from Capital Lending Center. I myself, I have been in this industry for just barely about three years, but I've been working for a bank before this for about 20 years. And I specialize in personal finances, especially mortgages. I have worked anywhere from offering clients mortgages to actually leading a team of sales officers for mortgages. And my last job at the bank is actually I work at the head office and creating mortgage policy, creating mortgage policies, and also like um, the pricing tool for uh, for across Canada. So today's agenda is going to be pretty full, and I hope I can make it through in about. 20 minutes. Uh, technically, I will have uh, some of the information that like uh, if most of you are first time home buyers, it will be very appropriate that you will get a lot of information. You might if you don't have a pen and paper ready, you can always call me back or like call Simon and the team back uh, to ask for information that we can talk about. So first question, first time home buyers, I think Sunil just like saying is like, should I buy? Or should I rent right now? It's been one of the biggest questions out there in the market. So let's take a look at some of the things that is like buy versus rent. So if you are buying, the good thing is we, you know, you're building equity. Real estate technically is a really good investment and is a very good part of, the it's been a very good part of your investment portfolio because have a lot of stability and even though there's like a lot more privacy because now you're staying in your own home you can do everything nobody's coming bug you because it's your own space so it's like it, especially during COVID it is really is your sanctuary so for for that those are really good things to buy um but to a lot of people that is a commitment <clears throat> and there's ongoing maintenance costs like say I just have a little leak in my garage like over the weekend because of the snow so now i have to get people to fix it if i rent it then it's a landlord's issue right but this is my house i want to fix it and this is what i have to deal with and then in today's world the mortgage payments might be higher than rent, but as um simon just mentioned right now one bedroom is 2500 but two bedrooms i think they're going for sure going over 3000 which i'm going to show you some of the payments that you can see to see how it actually compares to it so um so so the good thing about like the the renting if you're not ready is like it may be cheaper but you have ability. you can move like like I like to stay in Durham region. I like to stay in, I want to stay in Toronto region. Like say there, there's a little bit of flexibility in that. Uh, it's like, as I said, there's little or no maintenance when you're renting. And some younger generations calls it financial freedom because they're not now tied down to a house to make these like regular mortgage payments. So, but the bad thing is for renting is you're paying someone's mortgage. Like the money that I collected for my rent, then it goes to the mortgage. So that person, your landlord, is actually going to uh, um, accumulate that equity that they have. 
And also the landlord is your boss, which means that it's like when they need something, they come to you and they say, oh, I need to take pictures. No, you have to let them take pictures. Oh, uh, I, I'm going to have to have a new tenant. So there's a lot of things that is not under your control that causes the instability of renting. So those are some of like the basic buy versus rent that you can see, but not everybody is ready. So you have to ask yourself, are you ready? And then uh, just to go back to one page. So, um, but the today, as you know, buying, if most of you are first time home buyers, there are definitely incentive that you as a first time home buyer. So if you are going to buy in, into like say in the city of Toronto, which uh, goes back to which accounts for like more than half the sales there. In the city of Toronto, they're giving you a land tra transfer tax rebate of $4,475, $4,475. And across Ontario, you will get per household a $4,000 land transfer tax rebate as a first time home buyer. On top of that, you may be even eligible for like a first time home buyer's buyer's tax credit of for the year that you bought the purchase in, that can be now up to about 1500 as they just passed the rules, they raise it from 750 to up to 1500. So there's definitely some incentive to become a homeowner. So now I guess this is like, I hope this will answer some of your questions, Anila, is like say, should we hold right now for lower rates? Right now, rates now are higher, but then the property price are lower. So in the next, on, on my next slide, I'm going to show you some of the differences on actually how, what are the, how it influences you or how it affects you to actually to become a purchaser today. And then Simon also said, I mean, uh, once the rates drop, then the people is going to rush to it. And then there will be starting bidding war and the price will be pushed up again. The other thing that you have to remember is like, there are, Right now, um, Canada is open to 1.2 to 1.5 million of immigrants in the next three years. And statistically, these immigrants that comes in, there will be 60% that will end up in Ontario. And 80% of those who stay in Ontario would be buying a house in the, within three years. In other words, if you are waiting and waiting, you will be in competition with another 64,000 household a year to try to buy a home. So can you imagine these people come aboard, they're ready, they have the down payment, they're ready, they wanna buy a house. Your competition is now increased significantly. And also with the rate lower, it will be like, a, like my, it might go back to 20 offers, 30 offers like a couple years ago. So this is where we have to be careful. So it might be time to, it might be actually a best time to buy if you can qualify even at today's rate. But let me ask you, I mean, if people is like my age or have been in the business for over certain years, 5% and 6% is actually a fair mortgage rate overall statistically. And this is where we're sitting on, but then, what I would ask you is like, instead of focus on the rates today, let's focus on the payments because the payments has to make you comfortable. This is where like, should I pay $2,500 in rent or should I pay $3,000 in a mortgage, which I own my own property. So those are some things to think about. So, I did some math for you guys. I know it's after some of us have dinner, so it may not be the best time to do some math, but I have done it for you guys ahead of time. So if I'm looking at a general purchase price in the 2022 with a house price of about 850,000. At that time, the qualifying rate is 5.25. So therefore the mortgage amount is about 620,000 and you require a whole down payment of 170,000. For that, your household income requirement will be 132,000 when the rates were lower. So the second line there, I'm using everything the, the same here so we can compare it directly. So with the same $132,000 household income, now, even though the qualifying rates, please note this is the qualifying rate, this is not your mortgage rate, 
the qualifying rate is at 7.09, which is almost 2% higher, you can actually afford a home, which is 705,000 with 20% down, but, but look at your down payment. Your down payment now has gone down almost 30,000 for purchasing. So for the same household income, and 705 versus 850, it's about it's about 12% difference. That means the price have, if the price have reduced by about 12%, then you can actually still be qualified with the same property. And if going back to where it's a 20% reduction in the house price from 850, then your house price is now eight, uh, sorry, 680,000 with a qualifying rate of 7.09 then you only need less than $128,000 household income to qualify. Mind you, because I use, the same, I use the same property tax for all of these properties, that means that in reality, if your home is $680,000, your property tax would not be $5,000. So in the bottom right, I actually use like what my assumptions are. They maintain the same for better comparison, but... I'm pretty sure like if you're 120 ish, then you can actually qualify for a purchase of 680,000. But again, your down payment now is also less required. Does it make sense to most people so far with this, uh, with this chart? Okay, so in summary, what I'm trying to say is here, the question is now the rates is higher and I cannot afford it. But the thing is, because even though the qualifying rate is higher, but because the purchase price now, the, per, uh, the price of the property has kind of reduced a little bit. So actually is the better offset with the same income, you might still be able to qualify. So don't get deterred and say, well, it's a higher interest rate. I cannot qualify before. I may not be able to qualify now. So let's talk about something exciting mortgage rates which i think is a very very hot topic and i'm i don't know i'm not sure if anybody heard of the word disinflation this actually is a word right now it's called disinflation and this quote actually comes from federal reserve chair jerome powell he say we can now say for the first time that the disinflationary process has started we can see it. So with all of these prime rate increase, Bank of Canada rates increase, what happened is now we can see is like inflation is actually under control. That's how they come up with the word disinflation. It's not a deflation, it's a disinflation. So I'm not sure how many economists we have on this, uh, in this group of people here. Uh, I unfortunately don't have a crystal ball to forecast any rates, but if you can see from this particular graph here, the orange line is the five-year bond yields, and the green line is actually the discounted rate or the average rate for fixed and variable rate. So you can see from since July uh, till 2022, those two lines are pretty much overlapping each other. Meaning, if you know, the bond yield actually has a strong record of predicting mortgage rates. And it's with this, you see the last little part here, it starts to open up a little bit. There's about a 1.5% difference between the bond yield right now and our current mortgage rates. To a lot of like economists, that is actually is a signal that the mortgage are possibly going to fall. But... At the same time, we also have to look at our very dear neighbor, the U.S., because they did say they are going to continue to hike, and that will also aff uh, affect our bond yields in the next little while. I can only tell you from statistic and historically what is there. But if I go a little bit deeper, it's like, say, um, that's U.S., right? But U.S. does have an effect on us, but it's not direct. It's like an indirect hit on us. So we just like have to kind of do our due diligence in Canada to see that. But if I'm going to ask you to take a look in the very first part of the graph there, starting from July, uh, from, starting from 2017, actually, there, our prime rate has not gone up. 
since 2015 until the first climb was actually in July 2017. And then what you can see is also every time they increase, they increase only by a quarter percent because that's how they regulate the system. And that quarter percent was increasing until October 20 and 2018. So you can see that orange line was like climbing a little bit and the, um, the green line was climbing a little bit between 2017 to 2018. And then the rate actually has remained unchanged until COVID hits in March, 2020. Since then, in March, the Bank of Canada actually has decreased the rate three times in that one month to an all-time low of an overnight rate of a quarter percent. So you see there's a big dip actually in 2020, and that's what happened. And then so now the Bank of Canada has decided to start to bring the rates up to control inflation. That's why we call it the disinflation. The first increase was March 2022, which is actually two years after they decided to bring the rates to the all-time low. And then they have continued to increase the rate for the past eight announcements. And hence, we're now the overnight rate is at four and a quarter right now. So, um, so we can see, if I actually take away the dip, um, if you see here, if I actually take away the dip in here, actually the line is not climbing too fast. It's just because we have that COVID dip. That's why everybody is scared right now. That's really what the market is. In our business, we said the sky is not falling. If we don't have COVID, we probably is at the same rate right now. It's just not drastic move. So tomorrow, it will be another announcement. So it was very unsure if they're going to hold or they could put a, put a quarter in it. So, but then uh, after after March 8th, the following one will be April 12th. So we're going to have to see what the government decided to actually with all of these budgets that's just announced. And with now we have our inflation is slightly under control uh, with the employment rate. All of those things, it will have all of the effects. So we'll wait for tomorrow at uh, tomorrow morning when they actually announce if they're going to hold or if they're actually going to increase the rate. So as I said, what's happening really with all of these rate changes, what's happened? So what I have captured is like, say there's three types of, mostly three types of uh, mortgages rates that we deal with. One is the insured, is when people have less than 20% down payment. What is called insurable is when they have, uh, when the purchase price is less than a million dollars and they have 20% of down payment. And one is the uninsured, which is when the property is over a million dollars. So what I've captured here is like, if you go to if, if you go to a restaurant and have seafood, they call it seasonal price or market price. That's what I'm calling like the mortgage uh, rates right now, because you can see they actually fluctuates. There is no one way street. So you can see and for insured, it dropped on February 10th, but it goes back up a week later and it's now has gone up again. For insurable, it went up and then it went down and then it went up again. And then even for insured, same thing. It went up and down, it went down, it went up and it went down. So the reason why I want to show you this, what the rates are going is like, do we really want to wait for the rate? Because is rate an impact on you to actually to decide if you want to buy your house now? Because the rate is fluctuating so much that I cannot even tell you tomorrow what is the rate is. We normally in the in a couple of years ago, we normally will be able to get like rate changes, maybe like three days before the actually they tell us like we're changing our rates like in three days. So get all your uh, application in. Now we get it sometimes, if not the night of, it will be even like we're changing 12 o'clock at noon. So this is how quick and how fast the lenders now are reacting to the rate changes in this market. So come back to the story is like, should I wait? Because like, yeah, like if there is a gap in the bond and the market rate, it looks like that market, uh, the mortgage rate might be lowering. Should, should I wait? Now, I don't know if you guys have a crystal ball. I don't, 
but I can tell you it's very unpredictable right now with the rates, but it seems like it's sitting around the 5% area, depends on the type of transactions you have. So for me, it's not worth, it's not really worth, um, it's not really worth waiting if you're really ready to own, especially owning your first home and become paying your own mortgage. So there's a lot of about the market stuff just now. So I'm going to go back to uh, some of the questions that people have is like, should I pick a fixed rate or variable rate? Because that's also one of the questions that I heard a lot on the street right now. So obviously with fixed rate, it comes with fixed payment. It's easier to budget because your payment is fixed. And then uh, it's the same rate for the whole duration of the term. So in Canada, you will have a term duration of anywhere as short as six months all the way up to 10 years. And uh, the, bad, uh, the not so great thing for a fixed rate is like if you decided to break the term that you're in, you might be facing high interest penalties. However, I heard about the variable rates. So variable rates that actually if your uh, payments can be fluctuating and the interest always changes with prime. So if tomorrow, if like nothing happens to the prime, then your payment doesn't change. But if prime's going to go up by a quarter percent, then everybody's uh, people in the variable rate, they will be going into uh, increase by 20.25%. Uh, and uh, historically, if you see, uh, I'll show you a graph that they are kind of a little bit lower than fixed weight in, uh, in the past 10 years. Um, so people sometimes prefer variable rates. And the good thing about them is like, if you decided to break the term, their interest penalties are lower. So as much as I say, historically, they have lower rates. In Canada, as of January 2023, 20 there is um, the number, uh, the percentage of variable rate mortgages versus fixed rate mortgage is variable rate holds about 32% of all of the mortgages. That means only one in three people actually have variable rates. So, that sometimes is like, it, it's where like uh, when when the media goes out, it's like say, oh, my interest rate went up. It's like, you know, I, my interest rate went up and I cannot affordable, I, I, it's no longer affordable and now I might have to get out of my house. The thing is one in three person might have, will have the variable rate. However, there are a couple of lenders, their variable rate are called adjustable rates. What they do is they're not true variable. The payments are fixed. So what happened is then that their portion, every time they make the payments, the portion of the interest will increase as time increase, and which, when, which we then head on to a trigger weight. The trigger rate is when then your payment is no longer servicing the interest going to be charged to you. In that case, nothing is happening to the client. What's happening is then your amortization get further extended in your mortgage. That's how it is. So if say out of the three out in one of the three people are invariable, but if that one person out of ten of the variable holders that are is in the so-called adjustable rates, the payment is not changing. So it's not like they're not affording, they're not able to afford it. It's the amortization behind it has been increased. So there is like there is like a slight difference in, in these type of rates. So if you ask me if you want, should I check, pick a fixed payment or a variable payment? It's really, is a very personal choice. Some people like the stability, like some people won't even take a three year, even the three years on a special, they will only take a five year fixed rate and they're only stuck with five year fixed rate. So you know, some people is like, oh, I'm gonna ride the market. So I'm gonna do the variable rate because I think it's gonna come down soon. So it's really is a very, very personal choice of the client decide between a fixed or a variable rate. In today's market, there are a couple lenders, they offer multiple mortgage components under the same mortgage, which in some cases you can hold partially variable and partially fixed rate if you want to ride out the risk. So there are a lot, as I said, the reason why I become a mortgage agent is now I have all these solutions for my clients and it really has to fit in 
your own financial situation, which term or which type of rate will best fit your needs. As I said, you will see this one is where the blue line is actually the fixed rate and the green and uh, the orange line is the variable rate. So you can see those two lines are technically pretty much in sync for like for like 10, nine years until January 2021, where they actually dropped the prime rate three times in one month. That's where you start to see the bigger gap between fixed and variable. So there is, so there is, um, so again, it's a personal choice, but we can see it's really, really head to head if you want to decide on a fixed or variable rate. So now let's get into the nitty gritty things. How do I qualify for a mortgage? So, there are different types of in income is one of the most important thing to so say is like, are you salaried? Are you part-time? Are you full-time? Or are you self-employed? Um, so different lenders now have different options for each of these categories of employment. And uh, there is always this something that fits. Credit score. Credit score is very, very important in the mortgage world. Um, and when most banks are looking somewhere, if you have your own like uh, credit check, most banks are looking for somewhere around 650 to 680. That is the entry point for most of the banks. Down payment. The down payment actually can come from either gifted or from or your own savings. And uh, you can even take it out from your RSPs. And there is going to be a new home buyers TFSA coming out uh, shortly. Uh, so, and for gifted, we also have seen in Toronto itself, in uh, specifically in GTA, we have seen parents as a gift average out to be $130,000 to give it to their kids to buy their first home. Uh, mortgage time, I actually have, uh, I actually have touched on it like before, which is the insured, insurable, and a conventional one. Uh, the, so what the banks offer is the banks offer one rate for all of these, most of this. It's like, say, it doesn't matter if you have 5% or 20% or 35% down payment, they normally have like very similar rates. Whereas uh, other mortgage financing companies out there, due to risk on how much down payment you put down, sometimes like uh, um, the rates are different when you are able to afford um, uh, a higher down payment or if you have less than 20% because, when it's insured, someone else is taking the risk away from them. So they are okay to give you a slightly lower rate uh, in that case. So in short, or in summary, there is a program for everyone. It's just a matter of you have to reach out to discuss what are your plans. So we can actually go and discuss what program is out there among my 40 plus lenders that will fit you. One of the things that can help your, uh, your uh, one of the things that can actually help you to further qualify is extending an amortization. So currently, if you are an insured mortgage, meaning you have less than 20% down payment, you're only allowed maximum of 25 years amortization. But when you have over 20% 20, 20 or more, then you can go up to 30%, I mean, sorry, 30 year amortization. And there are some so-called B lenders, which are the smaller lenders. They can, some of them, they can actually go up to 35. So here, I just want to give you um, a, a kind of a, a, a look to see is what is the difference when there is a five-year difference in amortization. And I have a close, like the actual payment difference for you here. And what is the income required? So if generally, like, say, if like you, you have like, less than 20% and you have to go for 25 years. If your mortgage amount is $600,000 with a rate of 5.09, your monthly payment is about $3,500 and you need about 179,000 uh, 179, total household income to be qualified. But if we can actually, if you have the 20% and we can extend it to 30 years, then your income is only, you can be qualified uh, with 170,000 
And also your mortgage payment will then actually come down to 30 to 35 or approximately. So you have some savings in your monthly payment based on that. So this is just an example how we can help you to qualify uh, is by using extended amortization. There's some, also one other product that we can offer, which the bank does not offer, is called no, a non-stress test product. What is this is like, um, these are products for clients that have 20% down payment, but because of the high qualifying rate, uh, they are not able to get qualified. So this is, uh, again, this is a chart that is based on everything that is like on the same playing field with a household income of $135,000, if we're gonna qualify you through the qualifying rate, which is the stress test rate, uh, whichever your contract rate plus two, at, so I use 739 right now, your loan gonna be qualified, is gonna be shy of $600,000. However, if we are able to take you to one of these lenders that they don't have to do the stress test, same $135,000 with a contract rate of five, 0.89, you can actually be qualified for over 650,000. And if I even do like an other a difference, another half a percent difference at 6.39, you still be able to qualify over 620,000. So that stress test rate of plus 2% does make a difference of what you can be qualified for. So those are just a couple of the examples of how I can actually help you with all of my lenders that actually to get you to qualify for the mortgage. So um, in, in some cases, like I have, uh, I actually have uh, realtors that will come to me is like, I actually, Simon does this with me too in our partnership is like, you'll have a client not sure if they're re ready to buy, then I'll actually run the numbers behind the scene with a, with a, with a couple of uh, meetings, uh, a couple of uh, appointments with the clients and I'll run the numbers to say if they're ready to buy. And then I'll let Simon, as I would like the client no, like tell Simon that this is how much you can shop for. Like this is the range of the property that you can buy. And then they will go back to Simon to say, okay, well, Peggy said I can be qualified for this much. So what can you find me? So those are some of the partnership that I have with Simon's 